Hello, everyone. Again, it's uh, Dr. Al Hewer, uh, A&T Lectures, uh, part of our uh, Adult Critical Care Specialty or ACCS exam review. Um, this particular portion will focus on foundations of pulmonary and critical care pharmacology. And if you will, the uh, overriding comment that I'm going to make as I uh, delve into this topic is um, I, I don't mean to insult anybody's intelligence or diligence or clinical knowledge um, in that we, we do review for the sake of completeness the inhaled medications that, that we give as respiratory therapists. And if you're a nurse that you've you know either assisted in giving or you've seen given or whatever the case may be. That's actually, you know, so I have some slides there. I, I spend a little bit of time going over that, but the assertion is you guys are pretty solid on that stuff. And when it goes into Heliox, you know, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more extensively or uh, Flowline, which is e and all, I'll talk a little bit more extensively about that, I, I know. But when it comes to, you know, some of the bronchodilators, inhaled steroid and stuff, I'm really not going to spend a ton of time, but I did include them because I would be remiss if I didn't. So let's take a look at some of the learning objectives. So we're going to review the indications, contraindications, doses, frequencies, and you know, special considerations for inhaled medications, inhaled medical gases. Because you think about a gas, medical gas, you know, oxygen is a drug. Okay, so inhaled medical gases, we'll review those as well. Uh, cardiovascular agents, steroidal and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, diuretics, ACLS medications, the really the first line ACLS meds, sedative, hypnotics, and other psychoactive agents, other agents commonly used in the adult ICU, ER, or ED. And we'll also examine some sample questions, answers, and probably most importantly, the explanations. What makes the correct answer correct? What makes the incorrect answer incorrect? So typical uh, inhaled sympathomimetics or adrenergic bronchodilators. Again, for the sake of completeness, I've listed them here. Um, I, you know, and funny or not, you know, the very bottom there we have aphromotorol, which is Brovana, which is Brovana. You know, special consideration there is it um, it needs to be refrigerated. You can see the dosing there. Um, and again, it's some, some hospitals don't even have it on formulary. Um, so the patient would need to bring it in from home. But, you know, again, starting all the way up with racemic. Racemic epinephrine is typically not given for bronchodilation, would be more for its alpha effects. So it's, it's vasoconstricting effects. And then a lot of your, your, you know, your medications that are kind of in the middle of the pack here, your salinogens, uh, which really, you know, account for the, the highest percentage of your uh, adrenergic bronchodilators. So just, you know, if perhaps some of the MDIs or DPIs or, you know, dosages or you're a little rusty on those, review those, but don't spend a ton of, ton of time, you know, reviewing that, this stuff. Power, uh, uh, some patholytics um, as well. So your short acting, you know, SAMAs. So your short acting muscarinic, you know, the, you know, the muscarinic side of the, of the adrenergic, um, uh, uh, central nervous system. So you, you have uh, obviously ipotropium bromide or atrovent. Um, you have your combos, you know, your, your duoneb, you know, ipotropium and albuterol. Then you have your long acting, you know, your spiriva um, and some of your other medications here as well. Continuous bronchodilator therapy. So, you know, why we're recommending it and setting it up and giving it mainly for status asthmaticus. Um, you know, it, it, you know, it's, it's, um, it, you know, in order to try to couple giving continuous adrenergic bronchodilators with, you know, continuous steroids, you know, perhaps heliox and, you know, other interventions as well. Um, asthmatic patients who don't get relief from multiple unit doses of albuterol, IV steroids, or they don't get, you know, say significant relief. Typical dose uh, would be 10 to 20 milligrams per hour by continuous nebulization. If you have any questions on um, doing this clinically, when you open up a, um, you know, the, 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 the uh, packaging insert for the mini heart nebulizer, it'll be on there, but I'm sure you have a policy and procedure that really talks about, well, how do you actually mix up the concentration so that, and set, if it's a syringe pump, set the syringe pump uh, up in a way that they're going to be getting 10 or 20, et cetera. Um, 
nebulized via a heart or hope pneumatic nebulizer, but that's becoming much less common with the, I don't wanna say advent, uh, but, but aerogen uh, nebulizer with a syringe pump setup. You know, important to monitor for side effects, uh, you know, deterioration of the condition. Um, and again, you know, hopefully combining this with other, you know, alternative and uh, adjunctive therapies, including but not limited to heliox therapy. Um, less commonly, just a word of mention, I know I have it in the slide here, but severe hyperkalemia, you're not curing the problem, but in rare cases, they may get at a minimum multiple doses of albuterol, but they may do some continuous, nothing to do with their breathing, but to, to get that serum K down until they can figure out what's going on. Mucomist or acetylcysteine disrupts uh, disulfide bonds. So if you think of a, of a molecule of, of mucus as a centipede, the disulfide bonds are the legs. They're not the backbone, they're the legs. And you know, mucomis can disrupt those disulfide bonds and by doing that can uh, thin the secretions. Of course, it smells like uh, you know, sulfur or rotten eggs. It's, it's also an antidote, potential antidote to acetaminophen overdose, which can kill your liver. Um, and it can actually be either um, done by IV or it can actually be done PO by mouth. Um, causes uh, bronchoconstriction. So it should, of course, be coupled with uh, a bronchodilator. So I have in the bottom here, treat uh, to give, uh, give with or pre-treat with bronchodilator. The typical doses are here. I don't think they're really going to, they may expect you to kind of recommend this along, you know, for a patient has retained secretions. Um, you know, again, direct installation or ingestion. Um, that's pretty much it for mucomist. Um, Palmazine uh, tends to be much more expensive than mucomist, but instead of uh, operating on the di disulfide bonds, um, again, mucus, the backbone of it is a, uh, a protein, you know, rich um, substance that the, you know, the, that, that uh, palmazine will act on. So it's not the disulfide bonds, it's actually the backbone. So it's a proteolytic enzyme, breaks down the DNA, uh, given once a day, should be refrigerated, uh, treatment for cystic fibrosis, discard if it's at room temperature more than a day, given only with approved nebulizers. And again, it, there's some of the relatively minor uh, side effects that it can actually have. The main thing is it's not given to everybody who has got retained secretions because of the cost factor. The dosing of it is 2.5 milligrams, so ironic, uh, same dose, not same med, but the same dose um, as we give typically for albuterol. Oral, so let's we're traversing to steroids here. So, you know, nice thing about uh, aerosolized uh, steroids is to have few, not none, but few side effects. So, you know, um, you have your, your uh, suppression of, um, you know, of, of your, um, you know, particular uh, glands that will secrete cortisol. Um, so you can have, you know, suppression of cortisol, um, which can be a big deal um, for, for, for oral or for systemic steroids. For oral, you typically don't have that. Um, so that's the good news. Um, Cushnoid or Cushning syndrome, um, which is kind of a, a, redis, a dis, uh, distribution of fat. The face can become like moon, and you know, a lot more fat, uh, appearance of fat in the face, you know, kind of making the eyes look a particular way. Um, with aerosolized, you don't have that. Uh, dependence, you have a, a risk, and it's a relative dependence, um, where once they're taken away, you have a resumption of the, of the effects. With uh, aerosolized, you don't really have that local therapeutic effects. So, you, you know, with, with oral or systemic, you can have that, but it, you also get all the other effects with it. With aerosolized, you're delivering it directly to those spots. Uh, resist, uh, risk to growth uh, development in children. There can potentially, because of cortisol uh, impact on the cortisol system, um, it can, you know, have a negative uh, impact there. For aerosolized, not so much. Ease of use, um, you know, potentially, yes. Aerosolized, that eh, depends. It's really depends. Cost. We don't really need to focus on that local air reaction. The main theme is this. We know we want to get those patients that need steroids to control their asthma, or in some cases, you know, COPD progression, um, that aerosolize is the way to go. And the, the less that they need to be on, you know, oral um, or, or, you know, IV uh, systemic, the better it is. Comparative uh, adult, you know, uh, inhaled daily doses of corticosteroids. I would say that you know don't spend a ton of time on this, but just have some vague uh, familiarity with this particular dosing. I think the main thing 
that the NBRC is going to want you to know is for your asthmatic patients that you would start them, recommend that they be started on systemic steroids and then traverse them over to one of these particular um, you know, mixtures as their condition improves. All right, now we're going from our, our you know, our um, pulmonary medications to some of the ones that relate to um, the heart and the coronary syndromes. So acute coronary syndromes, the actual, you know, etiology, you have a rupture of uh, uh, arthrosclerotic uh, plaque. Um, it will manifest itself by ST segment elevation. Um, reperfusion therapy is, you know, certainly the way to go. So percutaneous uh, coronary in intervention, let's say in the cath lab, uh, fibrinolytic therapy, such as you would have in your uh, TPA administration, your streptokinase administration, um, but also uh, given, there's a saying, you know, MONA greets these patients and it, MONA stands for morphine, oxygen, nitroglycerin, and aspirin. So oxygen, aspirin, sublingual nitroglycerin, and, you know, other things, intravenous uh, beta blockers, you know, these are some of the, the tools, if you will, that are used in our arsenal. Non-ST uh, segment elevation, so Plavix is one. We have these newer drugs that, if you will, um, can, can um, cause or inhibit platelets from aggregating, okay, Plavix being one of them. My MI or myocardial infarction really uh, is, uh, is associated with myocardial death. Uh, treatment goal is to preserve myocardial uh, tissue. Um, and the thing is with a, with a heart attack, there's tissue that dies, there's tissue, there's myocardium that could be stunned. So some of it can come back. If it's, if it's been uh, deprived of oxygen for a long enough period of time, it's dead. And it's gonna scar over and it's not gonna participate in the pumping ability and the conduction pathways through which it goes will affect that as well. Uh, Anti-thrombosis uh, um, was also, you know, one of the uh, treatment uh, um, methodologies and anti-ischemic therapy, anti-ischemic therapy, which is also uh, com comprises a whole bunch of things, but, you know, interventions in the cath lab and medications that can be given as well. Advanced cardiac life support, you know, so somebody had asked in the question and, and answer, is this from you know, ACLS or something along those lines? It's not, I mean, very little of this is from ACLS. I'm ACLS certified, but um, they're, they're going to want you to know, if you think back on, if you are ACLS certified, uh, you know, and if you think back, you know, on the algos for the adults, obviously not for the babies or, or the children, but for the adults, for some of the first line uh, and, the, and the first portion of the first lines of the different algos that they have for things like, you know, asystole, or, uh, ventricular fibrillation, things along those lines. They're going to want you to know, you know, the basics of that stuff. The, you know, when you, when you get down to, I'm going to talk about it later in this presentation, but amiodarone. So 300, you know, the, the initial dose is 300. Um, and they're going to want you to know that. But then, then what? If it works, if the patient converts because of all those efforts, what you're going to be expecting to know is recommend the patient be started on an amiodarone drip. They're probably not, not going to ask you at what dose. ACLS might ask you that. So we're not emulating ACLS here. We're not replicating ACLS. If anything, I'm replicating some, when I talk about ECGs, I'm replicating book chapters that I've written through the years and revised through the years, okay? Um, and paraphrasing other things that, you know, that I've used. But I, I would be remiss if I didn't talk a bit about ACLS. So no, this isn't a replication of ACLS. Should, should you just study just ACLS to prepare for this? No. Should you familiarize yourself with that? Yes. So hopefully the person that had that question, I answered that question. If not, you can chime back in the question and answer. I'll do my best to. So uh, medication access, so IV, IO, so intraosseous where they, they can't they you know can't get access through IV. Very important to try to get access to adequate access to IV because you got to give those drugs, um, even drugs like bicarb, which is not heavily emphasized. But if the patient is so acidotic that they're, they're 7 you know, 7.01 or something along those lines. The ACLS drugs that we give will not work very well or well at all, okay, if they're that acidotic. So if it means getting them, you know, getting their pH in the 7.2s in order to enable the other drugs we're giving to work, then that's what we do, okay? The way we do it is IV. If that doesn't work, IO. If that doesn't work, through the ET tube. 
So when you're giving the drugs, and I'll talk about them in a moment, through the ET tube, you typically double the dose. Some of the books say two and a half times the dose that you would normally give, okay? With a flush of 10 mLs, typically of a normal saline. If there's restrictions on normal saline, you, you could give it conceivably with sterile water. Drugs which can, can be placed down the ET tube. The acronym is NAVEL, N-A-V-E-L. So Narcan, Atropine, Valium, Epinephrine, and Lidocaine. Uh, maybe one question on that, but the key is through that algo, through the ACLS algo, is constantly referring back to get IV access, get IV or IO access. Medications for cardiovascular support, oxygen. So, you know, it, it often increase oxygen demand. So you may be giving oxygen uh, for them as well. Epinephrine increases uh, uh, heart rate and force of contraction will also, will also result in vasoconstriction. Yes, the reason why we give a, a epinephrine in a code blue is not to stimulate the heart. It's not to stimulate the heart. Could it do that? Yeah. The main thing is to achieve azoconstriction so that as they're pumping on the patient's chest, okay, that, that they'll be better able to perfuse the brain, the noggin, which is not very tolerant of anoxic conditions. So the main reason why we're given re, uh, repeated doses of epinephrine is for vasoconstriction. So adrenergic medication, increase in myocardial oxygen consumption, the initial dose one milligrams, and again, ET2 would be two to two and a half times that, and just being, bear in mind there's different strength solutions. Vasopressin, recently de-emphasized the American Heart Association, but you know, theoretically can, you know, bear in mind, the MBRC last updated this exam in 2017-18, okay? So it's probably still going to be on the test. It's still going to probably be acceptable, but the vasopressin for uh, in, in, in place of one of the doses of epinephrine. The dose for it is 40 units IVIO. Norepinephrine or levofed, levofed, vasoconstrictor, it's come up several times in various modules of the, this review, increases blood pressure, starting doses 0 0.1 to 0 0.5 micrograms per minute. Average adult dose to try to operationalize that is 2 to 12 uh, micrograms per minute. Also used for hypotension associated with shock. Sodium bicarb, alluded to this a little bit earlier, buffer of acids, metabolic, uh, given from metabolic, severe, severe metabolic acidosis. Um, also hyperkalemia, used judiciously during cardiac arrest, okay? One of the main reasons why it is used judiciously is once it's broken down, it will ultimately result in an increase in PCO2 once it's broken down. So it's like, oh, you, you know, benefit me now, pay later. Um, dosing is one milliequivalent per kilogram, does not solve the problem, but may buy time and keep pH in a range where other medications will work better than they otherwise would. Positive inotropes, increased force of contraction, DIG, so slow ven <clears throat> ventricular response to AFib and A-flutter, alternate treatment for different uh, forms of supraventricular tachycardia, um, digoxin, so, you know, estimating dosing uh, 10 to 15 micrograms per uh, kilogram. And again, uh, be cautious of, of uh, dig toxicity, which can actually contribute to various forms of heart block. Um, can also, um, you know, things like if the patient's complaining um, of yellow vision and they're, you know, they didn't have heart block, but they're having heart block now and they're on a high dose of digoxin, be aware. Milvanone. So it's a phosphodiesterase inhibitor. Remember, phosphodiesterase, among other things, is one of the enzymes that accounts for the deactivation of some sympathomimetic drugs like albuterol. Okay. Uh, given to heart failure patients, um, the dose is 50 micrograms per kilogram or the recommended dose, followed by an infusion that's, you know, you can read like I have here, titrated. So it'd be if it works or it seems to work, it would be start a, a continuous infusion or a drip. Don't mix with certain other drugs and can contribute to myocardial ischemia. So <clears throat> something to kind of, you know, you can get a benefit here, but lose some ground elsewhere. Dopamine, 
So dose dependent efforts are really positive inotrope, but it also can achieve some vasoconstriction. Uh, so dose dependent effects. So dopamine at low doses, one to two micrograms per kilogram can actually be a vasodilate. So you used to call it renal dose dopamine, low dose, one to two micrograms per kilogram per minute. Okay. However, at higher doses, and again, I don't like those dichotomous, you know, you have two or less, greater than two, whatever, but at two to 10 micrograms per kilogram per minute can increase cardiac output, can actually be a vasopressor, but it should not, should not be mixed with sodium bicarbonate. Dobutamine, two to 20 micrograms per kilogram per minute, be helpful in heart failure, can cause attacky uh, dysrhythmias, fluctuations in the blood pressure as well. Antiarrhythmic drugs, atropine, so, so, so uh, you know, sym uh, symptomatic bradycardia. So we're not talking about a well-trained athlete. We're talking about somebody who has bradycardia, you know, heart rates in the 40s, and they, they're dizzy, altered mental status, et cetera. So atropine is still is recommended. Um, it can also dry secretion. So it's not typically given for that reason, but be aware. Um, and the, the dose, uh, recommended dose as of late is back to one, one milligram. Repeat doses uh, every three to five minutes, but not to exceed a dose, a total dose of two to three uh, milligrams. May need to provide pacing is really the direction that you're going to often go with patients that have symptomatic uh, bradycardia. More anti-dysrhythmic drugs, so lidocaine. Again, talk briefly about it in various aspects of this review or various modules. Decrease uh, heart rate, decrease excitability or cardiac excitability can drop blood pressure. Not surprising, right? If it has this, uh, you know, relaxing effect, lidocaine, it reduces irritability. It can also result in an increased vaso or uh, decreased vasomotor tone, tone uh, and a decrease in blood pressure. Uh, increases uh, fibrillation thresholds. So, you know, the, the excitability, we're at a point at which the heart starts uh, quivering, whether it be, you know, the upper portion atrial fibrillation or hopefully not the vent ventricular fibrillation, it will make, make it harder for the heart to stay in that, in that lethal rhythm. Uh, initial dose, 1 to 1.5 milligrams per kilogram IV. And then you can see repeated doses would be like half that. Amiodarone then can be given for your supraventricular tachycardias, but it's also the mainstay drug in ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, um, 300 milli milligram IV push initially, 150 subsequently, and then if it works and the patient converts, recommend they be started on an IV drip. Pretty much, ex much as as much uh, respiratory therapists are expected to know. For canamide decreases automaticity. So this excitability, this, this, if you will, conductivity, slows intraventricular conduction. Dose 20 to 50 milligrams per minute, but can cause hypotension. So, you know, you're controlling the heart rate, but can be an issue. So magnesium sulfate, FYI, not really used so much in this country as a bronchodilator. I mean, it, it is, but not a mainstream, okay? It'd be like that patient who has refractory, refractory uh, asthma or, or status asthmaticus, they might try MAC for a patient like that, okay? Along with everything else, continued bronchodilation, heliox, et cetera. Um, but more in, in this context for a particular uh, dysrhythmia known as torsades de points, torsades de points, okay? And that is a dysrhythmia that's almost universally associated with magnesium depletion for patients that are, uh, I say, I'm not picking on homeless, but homeless, malnourished, drug addicts, alcoholics type of deal, um, that whole kind of cluster, they can come, they can present with that, and they can respond very well, at least for the short run, to a magnesium uh, repletion, repletion. Calcium channel blockers, also rate controllers. Um, one of them is verapamil, so negative chronotropic and inotropic effects, prevents SVT, so ventricular tachycardia can treat it, you know, alternative after adenosine, and we'll talk about adenosine in a moment, uh, uh, limits calcium, so it really it has to do with the exchange of ions, so we'll limit that exchange of calcium 
which can slow the rate down that way. So different do dosages that are out there um, can cause a decrease in blood pressure. I don't think you're going to need to know the doses of something like rap rapamil. Um, for adenosine, um, temporarily stops the heart, pray for a return, but temporarily in interrupt the heart to allow it to kind of restart, you know, to, to reset itself. Initially, six milligram rapid push. If that doesn't work, you would try, you would recommend trying 12 milligrams rapid push if the initial dose is not effective. Uh, best to be in reverse Trendelenburg position. So that's with your head up slightly, but kind of like in the, in the, the bed is, when I say flat, the bed is straight, but the head is elevated. So it's not like, you know, semi fallers, high fallers. It's the bed is still kind of in a straight position, not bent. Flushing, dyspnea, and chest pain can be some of the uh, side effects. Bear in mind, methylxanthines, theophylline, caffeine can block the adenosine response. So it's kind of a little subtle thing there as well. Beta adrenergic blockers, so indicated in acute MI. So catecholamine production, some of the ones that are, you know, uh, antenolol, metoprolol, propanolol. If it ends in LOL, it doesn't mean, you know, you know, laugh out loud or whatever. It's probably a beta blocker. Antianginals, so the patient is not having a full-blown MI, but they're, you know, they're, they're uh, having some chest pain. It looks they've had a history of angina. Um, you know, they're, they're things like their, their ECG is suggesting angina. Um, then it's, you know, these beta adrenergic blockers, beta blockers can be uh, beneficial. The one thing to be aware of is that we want them to operate on, you know, we're constraining the beta one, beta one, slowing the heart rate. But some of the older beta blockers will also inhibit beta two. And for patients that have a proclivity towards bronchospasm, a history of asthma, et cetera, it can be problematic. Heart failure, so digoxin, positive inotropic medication, dig, uh, increased cardiac output, increased renal perfusion. But again, there's the, the hazards that I mentioned uh, before. Again, a little more beta blockers, slowing the heart rate, more ventricular filling, reduced myocardial oxygen demand. But some of the examples are here, just as I mentioned earlier. Some of the drugs more specifically aimed at heart failure, heart failure, so your angiotensin converting enzyme, so ACE inhibitors, inhibit enzyme that converts, <clears throat> pardon me, angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 is a potent vasoconstrictor. So think about this. So if it's inhibiting a potent vasoconstrictor, it's achieving vasodilation. Decreased vascular resistance because of that dilation. Aldosterone secretion, which can also further uh, potentiate the vasodilation and also salt and water retention. And some of the examples here, um, captopril and some of the others that are uh, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, ACE inhibitors. Vasodilators, so decreasing blood pressure, reducing afterload, dilating arterial vessels. So hydrosoline being one of them, dilating um, venous vessels, decreasing preload, such as those mentioned here, affecting both arterial and venous vessels, so ACE inhibitors. And just again, some listed here. So here we have the ACE inhibitors, but they're now categorized under the broader category of vasodilators. Diuretics, so you're not, you know, as, as much treating, you're treating the fluidic aspect of it. And I mean that in, in that, you know, that you want to reduce fluid volume for the short run, for the short run, um, in order to decrease various pressures in the heart um, and help preventing backup of the plumbing system like we discussed when we went over hemodynamics. So diuretics, ridding excess fluid. Use caution not to eliminate, you know, needed electrolytes such as K or potassium. Different types of uh, diuretics. So you have loop. And again, loop diuretics operate mainly in the loop of Henle in the renal structure. So loop diuretics most often used for ridding ex excess fluids such as Lasix. Um, loop diuretics are potent. 
um, and they work quickly. They work extensively and they work quickly, assuming the patient has some a modicum of, of uh, renal function. Side effects for diuretics, so, you know, dehydration, hypokalemia, so your electrolytes, you know, your, your various electrolytes can become depleted because the patient's urinating uh, out. In the case of uh, CHF, it's very common for part of the care plan to involve the patient weighing themselves daily or the patient being weighed by others daily. Um, and again, when weight, um, you know, when weight varies uh, day to day and week to week, particularly if it's increasing, it can be a sign of fluid retention, particularly in the face of a diet and a, a physical exertion, which remains relatively constant. And then it's really it can be one of the warning signals that patient goes up four pounds in a week, nothing else really changed. They're not eating more, they're not you know, exercising less or more. They're, they're pretty much in a steady state. It's suggestive that that fluid's going somewhere and they may be headed for a crisis and best uh, to, to try to avert it. Angina, so now we're, we're just going looking at a particular drugs in the context of, um, you know, different treatments. So chest pain, so myocardial ischemia, the tissue hasn't died, but it's, it's uh, you know, it doesn't have enough oxygen, a lack or insufficient amount of oxygen. Treatment goal is to decrease oxygen consumption, giving nitrates to achieve uh, a vasodilation and better oxygen delivery, beta blockers to slow down the cardiac excitability and the heart rate and calcium channel blockers to do so as well. Subgroups, I'm not going to pick this slide apart, but just understand that subgroups of drugs for angina. So this is really talking about anti-anginals, the broad category in the very top there, sort of in that, you know, a raspberry color. And you have vasodilators and cardiac depressants. All right, so two major categories. And then within those categories, vasodilator, you have nitrates and calcium channel, channel blockers. Now, notice calcium channel blockers achieve both cardiac depressant and vasodilation, right? Cardiac depressants, you also have beta blockers. And then you're kind of following it down. So by, if you will, attacking the problem with, you know, pharmacologic intervention, also limiting a, a, a fluid administration, also uh, careful uh, watching diet, you know, your diet, things along those lines, that some of these patients, you know, can be, um, you know, can be monitored uh, 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 and managed relatively well. It tends to be a delicate balance. And unfortunately, heart failure tends to be progressive in many patients. Um, so it's not a, a panacea, but it's in order to try to get them out of the hospital, keep them out of the hospital, and keep them in, in as relatively steady state as we possibly can. You know, they may be headed for an LVAD or you know, a, you know, right right sided assistance, or eventually a heart uh, transplant, whatever. But to keep them in as good a state as possible. There's also a lot of other newer medications that are being introduced, um, which you really aren't responsible for. You know, this time maybe when the with the the next revision of the exam matrix for ACCS, they may introduce some of those. Now we're switching to diabetes. Now, indeed, unstable diabetes can contribute to things like, you know, um, you know, you know, cardiac issues, um, cardiac ischemia, you know, blockages in the coronary arteries, but also things like peripheral vascular disease, things along those lines. Um, the fine vasculature of the, not just of the heart and of the extremities, but also of the, the kidneys and liver can also be impacted. So diabetes type one is failure to produce insulin. Type two is failure of cells to use it. Probably it may be the cells can't use it or the insulin that's produced is in some way defective. Both types encompass microvascular and uh, microvascular disease and complications. So diabetic patients are at greater risk for developing coronary heart disease, peripheral vascular resistance, uh, renal dysfunction, renal disease, and other uh, diseases as well. The ABCs, if you will, of a diabetic care or diabetes care. So uh, hemoglobin A1C less than you know a seven percent. You know, and again, relating that to average of 150 milligrams per deciliter glucose. That's the A1C is over a period of time. Blood pressure less than 140 over 90. It's still elevated, but keeping it lower. And your cholesterol uh, guidelines and triglycerides 
uh, being recommended there as well. Some of the medications for diabetes, I don't know that I'd really get this, you know, we know about insulin, okay? I don't know to the extent that I wouldn't spend a ton of time on this, but you can see that these mechanisms, that some of them, they, you know, increase insulin re release. Some of them, such as metform, which for patients that have mild diabetes, it's a pill that they can take. It, uh, it decreases the production of, of um, sugar, if you will. So it's, you know, glu uh, glucogenesis goes down. So there's different mechanisms of action, uh, different tools in our toolbox. Uh, insulin is still, some patients who are very unstable have an insulin pump, where it's kind of immediate feedback when, they're, when their uh, blood glucose levels go above a certain threshold, I don't know, 120 or, you know, whatever, that, that it will start pumping at a very controlled, in a very controlled manner, pumping, uh, you know, uh, insulin to the extent to which the uh, blood glu glucose is, um, is elevated. Now we're uh, focusing on hypertension. Hypertension, a lot of the focus was really on patients that have hypotension and getting, the, getting it up, you know, getting vasopressors in line in order to you know, have uh, uh, adequate uh, uh, perfusion to the key body systems. So the kidneys, the heart, et cetera. Um, but you know, now let's focus on hypertension. So hypertension, it's, it's bad. It's bad not just because you could spring a leak. It's spring, you know, like think of not a pneumothorax, but a leak, an, an acute leak. It's with each beat of the heart where the patient is, it's almost redundant, excessively hypertensive, where the systolic is much above, you know, 120, 125, 130, where that's really pre-hypertensive. Um, with each heartbeat, the vessel is being overstretched. So for a minute, two minutes, an hour, not a big deal. Over days, weeks, months, and years, that overstretching can cause these micro injuries to the vessel. With those micro injuries, and I'm, I know my camera is probably appearing you know, somewhere in this recording here, I think in the upper uh, right, right, right corner there where I'm showing with my hand. With each beat, though, again, those injuries are occurring, they will scar over and they can then become sites for plaque to adhere to, okay? They can also be potential weaknesses for aneurysms and things along those lines. We're talking about the high blood pressure. It's not just the, oh, you know, the systolic reached 190, patient sprung a leak, they had a hemorrhagic stroke, badness, okay? That, that certainly could happen. But it's also this constant state of being moderately hypertensive and it's not treated. And you have this, again, this effect that it has on the vasculature. Um, so hence, they're also at risk for stroke. Best uh, treated with lifestyle modifications, you know, diet and exercise uh, may require pharmacologic intervention. Um, we talk about, um, you know, lifestyle modifications. It can also be associated with untreated or undertreated obstructive sleep apnea. And all I'm going to say is certain dysrhythmias, which I talked about earlier, and certain forms of hypertension and certain forms of diabetes are worsened when patients have under or untreated obstructive sleep apnea, and they have these repeated, abrupt, startling awakenings that result in the release of stress hormones, fight or flight hormones, which increase blood pressure, increase cardiac excitability, and can mess around also with the, the insulin production and the quality of the insulin which is produced. So that's a blanket that kind of covers uh, other topics we've gone over in other uh, modules for the ACCS review, but also with this as well. So best way to treat hypertension is exercise, diet, but also keep in mind that under or untreated OSA can also be a contributing factor. So, you know, getting that under control um, is also an important factor as well. But ultimately, hypertension may well require pharmacologic intervention. Many, many categories, some of which we've gone over earlier on today. I would say this much familiarize yourself with some of the names. I wouldn't really sweat um, a lot of dosing of these. Just be aware that they're out there um, and you know, familiarize yourself with some of the names so that you can identify that it's a drug, you know, ACE inhibitor that could be given um, for a patient um, who has, who's, who's, uh, has uncontrolled 
hypertension. Anticoagulants, so indirect thrombin inhibitor, so warfarin, unfractionated heparin, low molecular weight heparin. So these anticoagulants mentioned, you know, earlier, we talked about patients that are in atrial fibrillation. A lot of these patients may actually be anticoagulated with one or more of these uh, medications. Direct thrombin inhibitors. So uh, Prodoxa is being one of them fairly new, but there's others that are out there as well. They don't so much, you know, actually break up clots as much as inhibit new clots from forming. So your patients that have atrial fibrillation, they're prone to have clots form in the atria, particularly the right atrium, um, where individuals have a demonstrable history of PE or phlebitis or deep venous thrombosis. Those would be these individuals who may well be anticoagulated. More on anticoagulants. So who should receive individuals atrial fibrillation? Again, a little more elaboration on what I just said, the history of uh, emboli or embolus formation, prolonged bed rest, coronary artery disease, uh, uh, venous thrombosis, phlebitis, uh, surgery with previous history of, of uh, uh, thrombosis. Ant Antiplatelet drugs. So some of the ones that we have here. So uh, platelet phase of clotting is inhibited, aspirin being one of them but others, including Plavix, um, being others that are in this category as well. Mechanism of action for these antiplatelet uh, drugs. So again, top left, you have pl platelet aggregation. So antiplatelet anti work here, they stop uh, at this particular step, but then there's other facets that stop with the re release of thromboplastin, Okay, and vitamin K is needed for this step for this clotting, and then you have th uh, prothrombin. So you have you know different facets. I wouldn't spend a ton, ton of time on this, but it gives you a little bit of insight as to how some of these antiplatelet drugs work and where in the clotting um, function and steps of clotting that they actually function. Fibrinolytics and what we're talking about to be clear here are in are drugs that are most commonly given for patients that are having an MI, um, where it's a, you know, a cardiac, you know, ischemia is going on um, and they're at risk for, you know, either they're having a heart attack or they're at risk for, for having a heart attack. So that they dissolve existing clots. So thrombolysis is the terminology. They tend to be in a category of, of drugs known as enzymes, okay, and Again, the category is TPA or tissue plasminogen activators, TPA. Sometimes they'll crudely say the patient was TPA'd um, terminology. But some of the drugs that can actually be given or alteplase, um, again, uh, retrovase and T, uh, T and case. Um, a little bit, a lot of them kind of tie back to that TPA, you know, that, that TPA acronym. Um, but they're, and they, again, what I would say is this, is what you would need to, know, need to know for this exam is that TPA, the category of tissue plasminogen activator drugs are a viable alternative, particularly if there's not ready access to bypass surgery or a cath lab. Now we're going to neuromuscular blocking agents. This you'll need to know something about because we're recommending them for, um, for some patients who are asynchronous with mechanical ventilation, particularly if they're desaturating or they're you know, double clutching the ventilator or whatever, but also for shorter acting um, administration of succedylcholine to facilitate a rapid sequence intubation. Those are not the only indications for us, but those are two of the major indications. So pharmacologic paralysis for surgical procedures, post-surgery mechanical ventilation, Reduce spontaneous breathing, reduce really eliminates spontaneous breathing. Uh, prevent dislodgement of tubes, including ET tubes, but not only reduce oxygen consumption and improve uh, patient ventilator synchrony. For patients who have crappy ABGs and they're hypoxemic despite therapeutic PEEP, but we've kind of run out of the rope with therapeutic PEEP. 
we're now close to or exceeding a plateau pressure of 30, a, um, a driving pressure of 15, you know, and we're kind of, I don't want to see we're at our wits end, but blood gases are still not great. We're considering proning or we are proning type of deal. Patients will, will you know, a lot of these are these really sick ARDS patients that were COVID-19 uh, re induced respiratory failure. They ended up being paralyzed, chemically paralyzed in order to enhance synchrony. It's almost, I'd say at this stage again, kind of this, the standard of care that the physicians are pursuing and we should recommend to them. So the, the neuromuscular blocking agents, so depolarizing, depolarizing or also short acting, succedylcholine or nicotine um, will, will, will uh, happen fast, you, you often used to facilitate uh, rapid sequence intubation. What you should remember, and it's obvious, but everything's obvious if you know it, right, is as the physician administers the succedylcholine or the nurse administers it per the physician's order, and you're, you know, you're assisting with an intubation. Um, you know, you may be doing it, but you're, you're assisting someone else in doing it. And you've been bagging the patient, but the patient's been breathing. So it's an elective intubation. Patient's breathing, so you kind of hold the ambu by their, by their face, give them 100% oxygen, but they're breathing. The obvious thing is this. When they give this acetylcholine, they're going to stop breathing. So now you've got to breathe for them. You got to now, if you were just kind of like had the, had the bag valve mask, they were breathing, whatever. Now you need to get ready and you need to start bagging them, bagging them up, 100% oxygen. Non-depolarizing agents, longer acting, um, VEC, uh, geronium, pancuronium, uh, and others are, uh, are actually um, longer acting uh, and they're given more for your mechanically ventilated patients to get them more synchronous with the ventilator so we can control their oxygenation and their ventilation better. Depolarizing, a massive depolarization of the muscles, prolonged refractory paralysis cannot be reversed. So bad news is they can't be reversed. The good news is that they, they're shorter acting. Succedylcholine is your main drug of choice. Depolarizing, so succedylcholine, a little more nicotine, bolus infusion, rapid sequence intubation, quick and short acting, not without side effects, including most notably a malignant hyperthermia. Non-depolarizing agents prevent motor and end plate from depolarizing. So there is, you know, synaptic, it interrupts the synaptic uh, cleft, or the, the transmission of signal across the uh, synaptic gap there. Used for longer term um, indications such as mechanical ventilation, competitive antagonist medications. So they, these are capable. The non-depolarizing, longer acting, ones that are used for mechanical ventilation um, synchrony, they're capable of reverse, reversibility, and the drugs of choice would be neostigmide or uh, pideostigmide. Um, so they're uh, colon or esterase inhibitors. So the main thing is, so I would think that you might actually conceivably could get a question related to uh, reversing a non-depolarizing. You now want to, you know, now you're getting ready to wean the patient, maybe considering a spontaneous breathing trial, spontaneous awakening trial. In order to facilitate that, not just stopping the um, the uh, non-depolarizing agent, but also reversing it. Pancuronium, rocuronium, cisteronium. So again, all uh, non-depolarizing, fairly uh, commonly used. Nimbex is probably one of the most commonly used. A third of these. Um, I don't think you really nice to know need not not need to know metabolizing the bloodstream. Um, and then and Nimbex, the nice thing about Nimbex is it uh, decreases. So some of these uh, uh, non-depolarizing agents can cause histamine release. Nimbex tends not to, tends not to. Now we're moving over in rapid fire uh, uh, sequence to uh, sedative hypnotics and anxiolytics, anxiolytics. So sedatives, just to simply put, re reduction in central nervous system arousal, Hypnotics induce sleep, anxiolytics decrease anxiety, and again, can be given in, in conjunction with an analgesic medication such as uh, fentanyl um, to facilitate, you know, in, in, not just intubation, but maintaining intubation and, you know, and, and uh, having patients tolerate, better tolerate mechanical ventilation. Benzodiazepine, so Xanax being one of them, but Valium, Versed, Ativan being others. 
Um, you know, so some of the more common ones, I wouldn't sweat the, um, the dosages very much. Um, what I will say is when we talk about Xanax, uh, there's a fair amount of our COPD patients when they're home or on Xanax. Uh, and it, Xanax is, is a great anxiolytic, so a, a benzodiazepine, um, but it can also be very habit forming. So if you get a patient who's on daily Xanax, COPD patient, um, and they uh, come to the hospital and they're not given it, they probably will exude the very, you know, a, a worse version of the very symptoms we're, we're trying, they're on Xanax for, so they become more anxious. So the really important thing, if they're uh, really important on intake to the hospital for somebody, the nurse, the intake nurse, to identify the patient takes Xanax daily at home times two years. It's, that's, a, that's a long time. They're, they're undoubtedly have a tolerance to it. And if they, they will experience withdrawal, so that needs to be you know, discovered or, or discerned because if they're on a ventilator because of an exacerbation, um, they're going to be difficult to manage, much more difficult than just the COPD alone. Um, so they need to be given a, a certain medication in order to, you know, to, if you will, replete that. Or they need to be put back on Xanax. Typically, we wouldn't, they wouldn't do that. Typically, they give like a Valerian or Versed or Ativan. So Presidex, the thing that you hear about Presidex, it tends to preserve ventilatory drive. So I'm skipping ahead here, but it is, you know, a, a form of sedation, you know, central alpha adrenergic uh, antagonist used for sedation in the ICU, not as high an incidence of delirium. It's good. Tends to, as I said, preserve ventilatory drive, may cause bradycardia and possibly hypotension. So it has those, you know, not so good effects, but also for our patients who are trying to wean, get them switched over to Presidex. Uh, for the weaning process, they'll probably do better with it. Opioids, rate of uh, routes of administration, oral, intramuscular, subcutaneous, uh, intravenous medications may also be administered. Self-administration technique called a patient-controlled analgesia, or PCA pump, potentially given by epidural for certain, you know, certain forms of, um, you know, spinal stenosis, a, a surgical procedure, you know, again, a local localized surgical procedure, that sort of thing and a whole list of, of these analgesics. You know, I would say, um, just kind of uh, broadly put, I would say fentanyl, uh, morphine, and I'm actually looking as we're going through here. Those would be the two that I would most uh, point you to, to knowing a little bit on dosing, okay? And, how, and you know, effects and, you know, have an idea of fent fentanyl as far as what sort of doses you know, is a high dose, is a moderate dose, or low dose. If they're on high dose fentanyl and you're trying to wean them, the chances are that they're not going to wean very well. Um, likewise, morphine, having a basic uh, idea, you know, of, you know, what an initial dose might be for a patient in the ED, you know, uh, 10 milligrams would not be unreasonable. They should respond to that, even if they're, you know, even if they're not totally naive, but you do get patients that respond significantly to two to five. Uh, milligrams of, uh, of morphine. Don't, don't memorize this list, but just, you know, kind of pick and choose. And certainly fentanyl and morphine would be two that I'd become a little more um, intimately familiar with. Some of the side effects of opioid analgesics, so major concerns, respiratory depression, you know, related to uh, outright apnea, circulatory depression, shock, cardiac arrest, um, and respiratory arrest. CNS, you know, things you can imagine. Respiratory depression, decreased rate, decreased rate of breathing, um, cardiovascular reduction in venous and arterial pressures owing to the vasodilatory effects. Um, it can also result in uh, histamine release, resulting in blood, blood pressure dilation, but also potentially, you know, resulting in a uh, higher uh, rate of inflammation and even in extreme cases, airway inflammation. GI, so these medications will re reduce peristalsis. So, you know, these patients can become constipated. Um, they can develop nausea and other similar effects. The uh, opioid uh, antagonist, uh, Narcan, the most by far the most common one that's out there, pretty widespread, uh, very widespread. You know, only reverses the causes due to opioid overdose. If it's due to something else, it's not going to accomplish that. Uh, very well or well at all. The one thing I wanted to say also about Narcan is Narcan is going to, the, the, the um, duration of action for Narcan is going to be typically much shorter than that of the opioid. So they may need multiple doses. 
So, and the other thing too is uh, if the patient it has taken a lot of heroin or morphine, um, you know, or methadone, and you Narcan them, they're going to wake up immediately and they may be combative. So just you've gone from zero to 60 and, you know, in, in no time. So just be aware of that as well. Now let's look at anti-infective agents, anti-infective agents. Reasonable to expect, as uh, we talked about in other modules, patient develops a septic shock in addition to treating their, you know, their, their blood pressure and other uh, things as well. We want to get them started on the right antibiotic if it's a bacterial infection in order to try to get that infection under control and reverse that sepsis and reverse that sepsis shocks. Uh, gram stain distinguishes between cell wall types. Uh, gram negative is pink, gram positive is purple. Um, susceptibility testing, again, guides the antimicrobial uh, uh, therapy and the extent to which the, um, the microbe is sensitive is in part determined by the zone of inhibition, the extent to which it, it you know, the, the size and the extent to which it inhibits um, growth and actually outright kills the, um, the bacteria. Some of the agents, so aminoglycosides, gram-negative coverage, used in conjunction with ampicillin for gram-positive organisms. And again, you have some, you know, ototoxics so it can affect, you know, ears and hearing, nephrotoxic for you can have some renal impairment as well. And some of the examples are, you know, gentamicin and tobramycin. Um, glycopeptides, um, you know, treatment of methicillin-resistant staph aureus or aureus, MRSA. The significance of MRSA is that if the staph aureus is resistant to methicillin, it's probably resistant to a lot of other medications. So bacterial cyto, uh, glycoprotein antibiotics, so vancomycin, which is, is commonly given for MRSA, and, but there's some analog or cousin drugs that also can be used as well. Protein synthesis inhibitors, another category of antimicrobials, macrolides to treat pulmonary infections, such as erythromycin and others that are out there. ZPAC happens to fall in this as well. Tetracycline is an individual antibiotic, but tetracyclines are also a category. Broad spectrum activity. Don't take the, uh, with dairy products, it can render them in, uh, uh, unable to work effectively. And some of the uh, tetracyclines include tetracycline, but also do doxycycline, as well as some others listed here. So anti, other antibacterial agents or antibiotics. So you have folate inhibitors, so sulfo sulfolamides. So they tend to be bacteriostatic. It's what we had in our arsenal before antibiotics became widespread. But they still use sulfa drugs where you have a bacteria that's resistant to a lot of other medications that are out there. So inhibit folic acid and destroy bacteria used in, most commonly in urinary tract infections where the antibiotic is not, sulfa drug is not, uh, if you will, an, it's, it's not un, inactivated by the GI system. It goes through the GI system as a, you know, sulfolamide and it will be able to uh, get its way down to the intended area of the urinary tract and do its job. And I've listed some others, uh, others here as well, including one to treat MRSA. Other bacteria, uh, antibacterial agents. So uh, daptomycin being one of them, you know, these are more recently introduced an antimicrobials to treat MRSA and uh, vancomycin res uh, resistant enterobacteria or VRE. Then you have your um, flagell, uh, you know, which is used for C. difficile, um, and then your category of anti-tubercular agents. I wouldn't expect the anti-tubercular agents to be heavily emphasized in any stretch of the imagination on the, uh, the ACCS exam, although it wouldn't be unreasonable to expect a question or two in that direction. Then we have our anti-retrovirals. Uh, so really what we're talking about are, is anti-AIDS, um, um, related uh, medications. I would say this much, be familiar with the names and that's pretty much it. You know, maybe a question related to, you know, a patient that, is, what, what medications might you recommend to the physician for a patient who has, you know, demonstrable, um, you know, is HIV positive. 
um, and, and is exhibiting, you know, perhaps, you know, has an op opportunistic in infection. So you're treating the opportunistic infection, but you're also treating the, hopefully getting the um, viral loads to a level where they're imperceptible as we've actually seen happen in um, the past uh, decade and a half or more. Antifungals, what I'll say about antifungals is their therapeutic index, they tend to be potentially, uh, their effective dose tends to be uh, eh, a little closer to their harmful dose than a lot of antibiotics. So you have your nystatin, you know, for topical, what we have for candidiasis, uh, but one of your more common ones that's given for your stubborn, um, your, you know, fungal, systemic fungal infections would be amphotericin B, amphotericin B, which is listed here. Notice, no necessarily a, a, a dose that's indicated, but know that that's something that you would recommend for a, a, an odd fungal infection. As we, we're coming down a bit down the, um, the home stretch here, still a little bit of time, is heliox therapy. So talking about drugs, talking about a lot of drugs, you inhale, you take a pill, you get injected. In this particular way, case, we're back to inhalation, but we're, we're back to helium ox oxygen mixture. So heliox is odorless, tasteless. It is light in density. It promotes a laminar flow. Because of its, its low density, light density or low density, promotes a laminar flow for patients that either have upper airway, um, if you will, obstructive uh, disease, or you know, one that's uh, like a status asthmaticus. Um, the mixtures are typically 80-20 or 70-30. Um, uh, 60-40 has been um, described in the literature, but not, um, you know, it, 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 the, the amount of helium is getting you know, lower so that its ability to create a laminar flow is less. So for the MBRC and for, for clinical uh, reasons, um, most common um, mixtures are 80, 20, 70, 30. Uh, the one major delimiting factor is if the patient has high oxygen needs, they, they it may rule them out from heliox because really the most oxygen, supplemental oxygen you're going to give them is about 30%. Minimal side effects, except in some, some patients, it just doesn't work. So maybe a patient that has status asthmaticus or a patient that has an upper airway, uh, a um, you know uh, things like an adult epiglottitis where they've had a, um, a chemical exposure or something along those lines or a severe infection, unusual infection in an adult, um, and you just need to kind of you know get that get their work of breathing down, um, and until you can kind of get the steroids to do their effect, if it's a um, also a case of a, an infective process to have the anti infectives do their job. Nitric oxide, so nitric oxide's been around for a long time. Um, the main concentration here, I don't mean concentration of INO, but I mean the main focus would not be on nitric oxide given for cardiac reasons, for to reduce you know, uh, cardiac um, afterload. Um, it, it, the main reason it's given is for uh, you know, vasoconstrictive uh, conditions resulting from, um, you know, patients that have ARDS. And to, you know, they, they have a low V, so the body lowers the Q. They, it constricts the blood flow in order to equilibrate the VQ. But what it means is they have a low V and a low Q, not a good combination. So it, it increases the Q, the blood flow. So uh, treatment of increased peripheral vascular resistance, so it's a vasodilator um, delivered via the INO vent, which is in, interfaced with a ventilator, because the INO vent is not a ventilator in and of itself, to treat ARDS, and again, some of your infant, uh, infant respiratory distress, some of your other infant diseases. Main focus for adults would be ARDS. Measured in parts per million, usually start at 20 parts per million, in the ARDS world, in the cardiac world, in some cases, it started at higher levels. Monitor your methemoglobin levels, particularly if those parts per million start exceeding, you know, 30, 40, 50, chances of developing methemoglobin, which is, which is basically produced when um, oxygen and, uh, and inhaled nitric oxide come in contact with one another, producing nitrogen dioxide. 
which will result in increases in methemoglobin levels and crowd out the oxyhemoglobin. So we'll have a you know, deleterious effect. Wean in small increments typically start at 20, 15, 10, 5, and then adults often will be turned off. Okay, so they go from 5 to 0. NBRC probably likes that. 20, 15, 10, 5, 0. Be aware, if you go down to zero, they can have a rebound effect, in which case, you know, don't take your INO vent away. Don't even turn it off. I'd leave it on standby for a good hour and see how the patient actually responds when we're titrating downward and then eventually turning it off. Inhaled flow on or epoprostanol or similar analog drugs, it's a less expensive alternative to inhaled nitric oxide, selectively viola uh, violates, ventilates well, uh, ventilated lung units and reduces intracardiac shunting. There's few adverse side effects. One of them is a coagulopathy. Rarely is that an issue unless the patient is already coagulopathic. If they're already having issues with clotting, it could worsen it. Rarely does it cause this, you know, uh, unabashed uh, coagulopathy in and of itself has a relatively short half-life, approximately 20 minutes. So it, inadvertent discontinuation can be bad. It's, it should not be done. Yes, weaning, intentional weaning should be done. But oh, they're just going down for a 10-minute test and a 15-minute test. We can we, No, they should go down on it if they need it. Or maybe they don't need it at all. Indications, refractory hypoxemia and pulmonary hypertension associated with ARDS and acute lung injury, post-cardiac uh, sur uh, surgery, pulmonary hypertension, and hypoxemia. Okay. So again, those are the, the, the main indications for it. FYI, so Flolon or Epoprostanol is a cousin drug to Viagra, operates uh, similarly, except you got to think about it. If it's inhaling, it's not operating and, you know, systemically throughout the body, it's really affecting the pulmonary vasculature dilating. Let's look at some review questions here. So <clears throat> question one, after withdrawal of, of inhaled nitric oxide therapy, a patient becomes hemodynamically unstable and hypoxemic. You should return the patient to a prior nitric oxide dosage. Recommend administration of basal dilators, decrease FIO to the lowest level you can, and initiate uh, a rapid chest compression. That last one just a distractor. Let's look at the feedback. During weaning or immediately after withdrawing NO, nitric oxide, or INO, inhaled nitric oxide. Some patients can become hemodynamically unstable and or develop severe hypoxemia. The best solution in these cases is to restore the, uh, the INO or the NO uh, therapy level to previously uh, administered. Additional hemodynamic support, such as vasopressors and supplemental oxygen, may also be necessary, as well as close patient monitoring. We actually had a patient, although many patients can be weaned from five to zero, we had a patient, he ended up dying, a very sick man, um, where we could get it down, we tried to turn it off. We got it down to three eventually. And we went from three to zero. He didn't like it. So it's just like one, one of those deals. So he was atypical. He was not, not the usual. He's not what you should think about when you're taking the MBRC. Again, 20, 15, 10, 5, 0. You're called to the ER to assist in the care of an intubated patient who is having frequent PVCs. Due to hypertension, the physician cannot start an A-line. What would you recommend? A, instill lidocaine into the endotracheal tube. B, you can read the rest of them. Perform defibrillation, interact, inter, uh, uh, cardiac atropine. So let's look at the, uh, the general feedback here. In accordance with advanced cardiac life support of the American Heart Association protocol guidelines, lidocaine is one of the drugs that is indicated to treat PBCs. And one of the agents that can be administered by installation via the ET tube, lidocaine, epinephrine, atropine, and uh, Narcan uh, can as well. So it's just like some, something to keep in mind. As I said before, you would typically double the dose. Sometimes some of the books say as much as two and a half times a dose and chase it with 10 mLs, most commonly of normal saline or of uh, sterile water. Doctor prescribes Heliox for a patient ad admitted to the emergency department with an acute exacerbation of asthma. A full cylinder of 70 helium, 30% O2 is at bedside with a standard nasal cannula attached. You should A, 
administer the therapy with the cannula as ordered. B, administer the therapy and then draw an ABG. C, obtain a non-rebreathing mask and administer the therapy that way. D, obtain a Venturi mask and administer the therapy. General feedback goes like this. Because helium is so highly diffusible, heliopsin mixtures must be administered by a close, closed or semi-closed systems. Administration of helium oxygen mixtures by a low flow systems like a standard nasal cannula will cause significant air dilution and make the therapy ineffective, wasting your time. A specialized high flow cannula can prevent most of the air dilution and is a good alternative to non rebreathing mask, mask if it's available. So we actually started um, really more with COVID. It, it, you know, you, you could actually give heliox um, by a nasal cannula before, but that needs to be a high flow system. So it's really almost to think about, you know, low flow oxygen, you're wasting your time. High flow, they're probably getting some benefit there, but it, it has to be set up in a, in a particular manner. So just kind of keep that in the, in the back of your mind as well. Um, wasn't really done too much until maybe the past you know, decade or so, but there's a remote chance that something like that could appear in the, uh, in, in the ACCS exam. A first year resident orders a stat salmeterol servant discus treatment for an asthma patient who was admitted in acute distress to the ICU. Which of the following actions would be appropriate? There's two major issues with this. Administer the salmeterol therapy as ordered. B, suggest using an MDI instead of a tripowdered inhaler. I'm sorry, I can't even say that with straight face. Recommend albuterol prevental instead of salmeterol. Recommend beclomethasone, bansarol instead of salmeterol. Now I gotta tell you, in this case, folks, you may scratch your head and say, I don't really like either any of these answers. MBRC is asking you to select the best answer, the best answer, okay? Let's look at the feedback. As a long-acting beta-adrenergic or LABA, salmeterol or cerevent is used as a controller drug for asthma and is inappropriate during an acute or acute uh, phases of an asthmatic, an asthmatic attack. Instead, a fast-acting rescue bronchodilator like albuterol should be used. Likewise, as controllers, inhaled steroids are contraindicated in acute phase of an asthmatic attack. Systemic steroids may be indicated. Also, proper use of dry powder inhalers can be difficult in an anxious patient suffering from an acute exacerbation of asthma. Now, let me say this. I am not crazy, okay? I am not crazy about the whole notion of you know, MDI, DPI for a patient who is in a, a, a you know, severe asthmatic episode, okay? So C is saying recommend albuterol prevental instead of salmeterol. It doesn't say administered how, but it is clearly the best answer. So I don't, if, if it said albuterol via, you know, dry powder inhaler, I wouldn't like that one either, but it doesn't really say that. It just says, you know, it, redirect them in another direction and explain why. So the best answer, the ones that are listed, or, um, or, or uh, is C or albuterol instead of salmeterol. P.S. Salmeterol, and they lifted it about, just hesitating myself, about a little over a year ago, a year and three, four months ago, salmeterol had what's called a black box warning from the FDA that there were patients in acute exacerbations of asthma that were taking their, their you know, salmeterol, their cerevent discus, and did poorly or died, frankly. Um, and, and so it was for a good decade or so that CeraVent had a black box warning. It wasn't taken off the market, but it said, you know, the patients need to be properly educated on it, that it should not be used for, for uh, you know, acute exacerbations of asthma, but more as a controller, long acting um, adrenergic bronchodilator, SABA. It's a LABA and should not be used as a SABA. Five, after inspecting the rhythm strip of a patient under your care in the ICU, you note the occurrence of eight to 10 PVCs or premature contractions per minute. 
what action would you recommend at this time? So point of reference, if it said one a minute, maybe two a minute, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm a little concerned, eight to 10 a minute is a fair amount. So A, administration, you're recommending, you're not doing it, of an antiarrhythmic drug such as lidocaine. B, administration of an adrenergic agent like isoprotoronol. Isoprotoronol is going to also going to increase cardiac excitability. Eh. C, administration of an anticholinergic agent, gatropine, also going to increase the heart rate. D, cardioversion with a direct current discharge of 100 joules. Let's take a look. General feedback. Primary cause of PVCs is increased excitability of the ventricular myocardium or heart muscle. Although strong sympathetic stimulation is a common cause, a variety of chemical or humoral agents also provoke PVCs. Generally, less than six PVCs per minute requires no treatment. Higher rates above six, particularly if it's much above six, are treated with antiarrhythmic drugs like lidocaine or amiodarone. So they're using a threshold. Again, I, I don't like these, you know, absolute thresholds. Really what they're saying, hey, if it's two or three a minute, if it's, you know, eight, nine, 10, 12 a minute, it's cause for concern. Question six. A patient in ventricular fibrillation should receive IV epinephrine at what dose and frequent frequency? A, 10 milligrams every one to two minutes. B, one milligram about every three minutes. C, one milligram every six to eight minutes. And D, 0 0.10 milligram every nine to 10 minutes. Simply put, patient in ventricular fibrillation should receive one milligram epinephrine by IV push every three to five minutes, period. And again, the main driver there is what is to achieve vasoconstriction so that when you were pumping on the patient's chest that there or the lucas or the or the automated device is pumping on the patient's chest that we're also trying to best perfuse the the the, the brain and the uh, the neurons seven which of the following agents would be indicated for a patient with post extubation laryngeal edema. A, terbutylene sulfate or brethine. B, atropine sulfate. C, racemic epinephrine or vapoprim. D, acetylcysteine or mucamist. General feedback, you guys, I know the answers here, but even if it weren't, Laryngeal edema is due to capillary engorgement, fluid accumulation, and swelling of the laryngeal mucosa. Typically, a vasoconstrictor, alpha adrenergic agent, is used to treat mucosal edema. Racemic epinephrine is the only drug in the list with strong alpha adrenergic effects. P.S. The dose would be 0 0.5 mLs of a 2.25 solution mixed with normal saline, two or three mLs of normal saline. So 0 0.5 mLs of a 2.25 solution. Which of the following drugs? would you recommend for a patient with asystole? Amiodarone. Remember what amiodarone is. It's, it's going to decrease cardiac excitability. Patients, you know, asystolic, they don't have any cardiac excitability. Epinephrine, atropine, or magnesium. Let's look at the feedback. Epinephrine, one milligram IV push every three to five minutes is recommended uh, for treating a patient with asystole or PEA, pulseless electrical activity, whereby the patient actually has 
a rhythm. They have they have they have electrical activity, but they have no mechanical activity and no pulse. Atropine no longer is recommended for patients with asystole or PEA. Amiodarone, an antiarrhythmic drug, is used only for shockable rhythms. And by the way, it also decreases cardiac excitability. And magnesium is used to treat a very specific dysrhythmia known as torsades de points or polymorphic ventricular fibrillation. Nine, after three cycles of shocks and IV epinephrine, a patient continues to exhibit ventricular fibrillation. Which of the following drugs should be considered at this time? A, amiodarone. B, atropine. C, dopamine. And D, adenosine. And these, these uh, explanations have some pretty rich information in them in and of itself. So let's look at the one for this. If a patient continues to exhibit ventricular fibrillation after several shocks in administration of IV epinephrine, the antiarrhythmic amiodarone should be administered. Lidocaine is also an acceptable substitute or alternative. Atropine and dopamine are used to treat bradycardia, bradycardia, not a not VFib. Adenosine is the primary drug used to treat stable, narrow complex supraventricular tachycardia. Question 10. A physician requests an SBT or a spontaneous breathing trial for a patient being managed or ha who has been ma managed in the control mode with pavulon, okay, with a non-depolarizing paralyzing agent. Which of the following agents could be administered to reverse the effects of the pavulon? Pentothal, levofed, a nictine or succedylcholine, or prostigmine or neostigmine. General feedback. Since pancarodium bromide is a competitive blo uh, blocking agent, its action can be reversed by giving acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, such as neostigmide or prostigmine. That, I, I, that's a reasonable, is a reasonable chance that, that some, some variant of that would appear on the exam. Which of the following diuretics would you recommend for a patient in acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema? A, Lasix, B, Aldoctone, C, Diuril, and D, Diamox. So all of these drugs, by the way, are um, or diuretics, but let's look at some of the some of the explanation here. For rapid diuresis, a loop diuretic, loop, loop of Henle diuretic, like Lasix is indicated. Thiazide diuretics like uh, colathizamide and potassium sparing agents like sp spiral dactone simply cannot produce as much urine as fast as can loop diuretics. As tolozamide has weak diuretic properties, but is seldom used exclusively for this purpose. So the correct answer is Lasix. 20, 40, 60, or 80 milligrams. 12, which of the following agents would be indicated for a hypotensive patient in septic shock? Terbutylene sulfate, atropine sulfate, Levofed or warfarin. Explanation goes like this. Norepinephrine or levofed is a vasoconstrictor which increases blood pressure, which is often used in the ICU to treat hypotension associated with shock. Levofed is the only drug in the list with strong vasoconstrictive properties. So in some cases, these other medications are in here just as distractors, and let's say everything's easy if you know it, but the answer is relatively straightforward. 13, 65 year old patient, history of cardiomyopathy, has shortness of breath, respiratory rate's 34, 
saturation is 90 on a non-rebreather mask. Fine rowels on auscultation, middle and lower lung regions, and is coughing pink, frothy, sputum. Literally, you know, left heart failure, CHI. Which medication regimen would you suggest for this patient? Um, and again, you should do which of the following. A, bronchodilators inhaled steroids. Eh. B, positive ionotropes and di a, a diuretic. C, stat nitrate administration. And D, IV epinephrine. Feedback is like this. This patient appears to be having an exacerbation of congestive heart failure or left heart failure. Left heart failure, again, you have the back of the plumbing system. Ultimately, it's going to back up. That fluid is going to uh, traverse in the wrong direction, the alveolar capillary membrane from the, the arterial blood into the capillaries, across the capillaries into the alveoli, flooding them with this pink, frothy fluid. Increasing the stroke volume and cardiac output through a positive inotrope such as digoxin and a diuretic such as Lasix to reduce intravascular fluid is the best course of any of those listed. 14, a patient with asthma requires continuous IV sedation to manage invasive mechanical ventilation. Which of the following best facilitates daily sedation interruption for this patient? A, morphine. Again, morphine is an analgesic, but okay. B, atropine. C, diprovan or propofol, and D, Haldol. The explanation is like this. The sedating effect of diprovan dissipates promptly after the infusion is stopped. So this drug is best for daily interruption of sedation. The sedating effect of morphine, Ativan, and Haldol will persist long after interruption. Now, the thing is morphine, really an analgesic. Will it settle the patient down? Yes, but just, you know, mainly for pain administration. 15, 56-year-old male, terminal lung cancer, severe dyspnea. Patient has persistent nausea, vomiting, refuses IV placement. Physician asks critical care specialist to recommend aerosolized medication for these dyspnea specialists. So this is your hospice patient for comfort care. Um, in this particular case, you know, they're looking at morphine sulfate. It can be aerosolized, absolutely. Um, just try to steer clear of, it, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, it, it being um, aerosolized and you're breathing it in for obvious reasons. But inhaled morphine sulfate relieves the dyspnea with decreased side effects compared to sy uh, systemic effects. Albuterol relieves dyspnea related to a bronchospasm, but is unlikely to relieve dyspnea. This patient inhaled Lasix has been used to alleviate sensation of dyspnea but is less effective than uh, opioids. And uh, inhaled uh, Versed is not expected to relieve any dyspnea. So though this is not commonly done, it's commonly done in other countries, but it, it can and has been done. And again, you're not curing, you're basically doing palliation, you're, you're treating uh, the, you know, the patient's uh, sensation of dyspnea. You're not doing anything to treat the underlying problems, but you're making the patient more comfortable. Some selected resources, again, uh, similar to the ones that have been listed at the end of the other presentations. Uh, with this yet again, uh, thank you guys for persisting through this, uh, this review. Um, again, hopefully um, this is kind of, whether it's filled in blanks or, you know, like I, we, I all, we all forget things or we all, you know, we learn new things. So the, the things we learned a long time ago, you know, go somewhere and sometimes they go out the, the other side. Um, so hopefully this did a decent job of filling some of those gaps. I uh, appreciate your, uh, your, your joining me today. Hopefully you got something out of it. I hope to see you again. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. Bye.